Welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. A look behind the curtain of global finance and monetary control with one of the foremost experts in the field. Author of the bestseller Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution, Ellen Brown's groundbreaking work began the movement to create new American public banks. We'll look at issues surrounding the world of money and the systems and powers that control it, as well as the progress being made on the public banking frontier. The program is underwritten by Public Banking Associates, a national consultancy of experts advising government leaders pursuing creation of their own public banks at publicbankingassociates.com. As we've seen the explosion of predatory municipal deals, we've also seen that you know, really be used as a part of a broader agenda to push austerity and slash services on communities uh, across the country. That's Sakib Bhatti, one of our many guests on It's Our Money, talking about fraudulent financial deals dealt to cities and states by the big banks. Here's famed forensic economist Bill Black talking about the inability of regulatory agencies to control illegal financial schemes of corporations. So what people don't understand about elite financial crime is that we have a million folks in the U.S. in law enforcement. Of those, 2,000 in the FBI white-collar section investigate sophisticated financial crime. We have over 1,000 industries in the United States. That means we have fewer than two FBI agents per industry, and not corporations. That means three things. One, obviously it's not going to work. There aren't remotely enough people. Two, they can't possibly have expertise in the industry. And three, they don't walk a beat. They wait in their office until there's a criminal referral. And newsflash, corporations don't make criminal referrals against their CEOs. And these massive frauds come from the C-suites, or as the saying in many countries is, fish rot from the head. And here's noted economist Michael Hudson telling us about the franchise of global finance. Written into the Constitution of the Eurozone is that uh, really only banks should create credit and create it at interest. The governments should not provide money to the economy. Government should raise their money by selling off uh, their public domain to uh, private investors. The governments should not provide social services, should not provide infrastructure services, that all of these should be privatized. And that means building into their price structure interest charges, uh, exorbitant salaries, and economic rent for whatever the privatizers can charge. And Canadian iconic statesman Paul Hellyer describing the big picture of global financial strategies. What they're trying to do is to coerce the countries of the world into becoming vassals to do as they're told. And it's part of a larger scheme. And they want to create an unelected world government of, by, and for their own benefits. And unless we do something, that is going to happen. It's been going on for 60 or 70 years now, and we have done nothing about it because most people don't understand what money is or where it comes from. And Hazel Henderson, putting all this money talk into context. Isn't it extraordinary that we are now absolutely on the cusp of this paradigm shift? Too many ordinary people all across the political spectrum now, they say, where's my bailout? You know, people absolutely see what's going on. And naturally, this has created all of the anger about the particular kind of globalization that really Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan cooked up, which is all about GDP growth, which we know was not counting all those external social and environmental costs and has been sort of driving us over the cliff. And basically, it was just about privatization deregulation and financialization. We now know how many people that left behind. And sooner or later, they were going to rise up. You just can't impose this kind of cost on the rest of the population. They're not going to take it. Our opening montage today is a bit of a retrospective for us here on It's Our Money. This is our 100th program. So we thought we'd make a snapshot review of some of the recurring themes that we've covered over these past several years. Hello, once again, I'm Walt McCree, co-host with Ellen Brown of It's Our Money, 
a program that intends to enlighten folks about the what and the how of money creation and control and how it impacts our lives, communities, democracies, even our personal psychologies. From systemic deprivation of the have-nots to the blatant criminal immunity of the haves, money moves the world, and banking moves money. On this program, we've examined the intersections of money creation and primary civic and economic functionalities. What we've generally been saying through the many notable voices we've featured the web of monetary debt we live in is controlled and intended to control all our public affairs by private parties that control the world's monetary regimes and have usurped the power that rightfully belongs to the people. As our montage suggests, it's a concerted strategy played by a handful of oligarchs, frankly, around the world who keep the system under their thumbs through a wide variety of monetary systems and political devices. Later on in the program, we're going to have excerpts from the conversations that we've had with these noted guests of ours to dig a little bit deeper into the themes that they picked up. But to start off this anniversary edition of It's Our Money, Ellen and I took a look at where we've been with our guests on this program over the last several years, as well as some of the new things that are developing on the frontier of public banking. So, Ellen, since we started this program, a great deal of monetary upheaval has occurred uh, from the early days of the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing, where they were almost giving money away to the big banks, and then there was that the Greek financial crisis that was instituted by the global banks and the hedge funds and the EU and all of that, uh, that stripped that country, uh, as it did Cyprus, of you know a viable economy and robbing it of its assets, not unlike what we're seeing in Puerto Rico. Uh, the list of monetary events is long, and uh, we've really just barely scratched the surface even five years after we started this program. But, Ellen, another extraordinary thing has happened. They occurred in the elections just completed for public banking. Yes. So we had our ballot measure in Los Angeles for L.A. City-owned bank, the measure put on the ballot by the city council just in July. <laughs> we didn't do it. And, and there, there was no money to support the thing. And we had this very vibrant group of young people that were um, have just done an amazing job working on it. So, uh, well, the, the bad news is that we only got 42% of the vote. But the good news is we got 42% of the vote, which is yeah. amazing <laughs> if you think about it. Like yeah. with no funding and nobody's even heard of this issue. They did get some funding at the very end. I guess they actually managed to raise $60,000. But, you know, they should have had it a lot earlier to get out there with flyers to go in people's mailboxes, that type of thing. But they did an amazing job with sending out messages. So 42% of the vote is pretty good. I mean, that's very close to half. And yeah. Considering, I think, what was really the... The big negative, well, everybody thinks, was the L.A. Times came out early on and said that it was the most half-baked measure that the city council had ever come up with. Uh -huh. um, you know, there was a certain merit to that because it, it really was very brief. You couldn't – so the L.A. Times – argument was that we don't know what kind of bank this is going to be, that is the city council going to run it into the ground, how much money is it going to cost, who are they going to make loans to, all that kind of stuff, which they, they had a point there. So considering all that and we, all that the Public Bank LA group was up against, it's amazing how well they did. And we, we had a, a victory slash condolence party that was, I mean, they're still enthusiastic about pressing on. And, you know, they're just thinking, well, this now we'll do it this way. And we can't come up with a business plan, but we can definitely answer a lot of those questions. And now well, I guess they're going to aim for the state level carving out a special exception for a public bank. And then if we get that, that'll make it a lot easier. So yes. anyway, I was concerned, you know, that they might lose their enthusiasm, but they haven't. What will maybe be a roadblock is that the L.A. City Council, Herb Wesson, said in the L.A. Times, he had said earlier, and they repeated it, <laughs> I saw this morning, mm -hmm. that he had said that if the measure doesn't pass, that he was basically just 
sending it up the flagpole and seeing if the people wanted it, as was required under our city charter, and that if they don't want it, then he wouldn't proceed. So if the city council won't proceed, you can see that that could be a bit discouraging to the yeah. the group. And, and this, I think, is one of the unfortunate parts of the way that uh, the petition had to be crafted. People conflated and confused the idea that the vote for the referendum was to approve the bank. It's just implicit. Uh, people assumed that that was the case, even though it wasn't. So even though the ballot measure attempted to make a distinction between saying, yes, let's have a bank, to what it was really about, which was, yes, let's change the charter for the city so that we can have have a bank. That whole discussion, which is much more complicated, whether you know how the bank is governed, what it's going to do, the risk, all of that stuff, all of that was meant to occur after the petition would be approved so that the city could even consider it. So it's unfortunate because it puts an obstacle in the forward path of the city bank, of the municipal bank in Los Angeles, an unnecessary block, uh, I would say. Yeah, I agree. And, of course, we argued that they wouldn't have needed to do that at all because the way the charter provision was written in 1913 was that if that the city had all of the rights of a, of a municipal corporation, but that if the city wanted to pursue a fully commercial enterprise, that they had to get voter permission. So we would argue this is not a fully commercial enterprise. And Mark Armstrong's argument is that will say to all those <laughs> businesses that voted it down, say, fine, you don't need to participate. This will be a wholly public entity that will just refinance the city's own debt you know, more efficiently than is being done now through the bond market. Yeah, in dismissing it like that, throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, with this marvelous achievement that the citizens have done there, this campaign uh, inspiring, uh, has set up, has put a marker down with the city council. Uh, these uh, people said, look, we don't like Wells Fargo. We don't like what they've been doing uh, with our money. This divest uh, from the fossil fuel industry, the Dakota Access Pipeline, the funding of private prisons, the funding of payday lenders, the lack of funding for, for uh, small businesses. These are situations that people of Los Angeles should not and do not want to deal with. And that's what this campaign succeeded at doing. I think it's, as you say, it was a prodigious uh, Herculean task to take that on. They did very, very well, and I'm glad to hear they're still inspired by it. You know, what I think we're going to find, of course, is that other municipalities will say, well, L.A. turned it down, you know, and so that means it's probably not a good idea, which, of course, would be a complete misrepresentation of, uh, of, the, uh, of the whole effort. Um, but I guess that's, you know, when you have a binary choice, yes or no, um, people don't know what's behind those choices, uh, things like this uh, can happen. Yeah, well, and it is it is a function of the way the whole voting system is set up. I mean, you can't do a whole argument. You have to have a ballot measure that's just a one-liner. So the problem is people don't even know what you're talking about with the public bank. So that's what we need to do is more education. But on the upside, we've educated an amazing number of people. I mean, if I think it was like 270,000 voters. So uh -huh. that's 270,000 voters who said yes. Where see when we started the public bank a public banking institute in 2011, we were debating whether to call it public banking. We didn't because it's not really public banking. You know, a public bank really is a bank that is on the stock market that people can buy um, stock in, like a public corporation. Mm -hmm. So, but, but if we said publicly owned bank, then that was such a long and awkward term. So we decided, well, we'll just call them public banks and we'll kind of coin the phrase and that what it's all about. And now you people say public bank and they know what you're talking about. So all yeah. this stuff is a very slow project, a process of changing mindsets and changing, first of all, even understanding how banking works and why we're screwed under this current system. If, yeah. See if I can slightly change the subject. This is something I'm really kind of excited about right now. I'm, I'm working on a, my third book on this subject, my 13th book, so I'm almost done. And I was writing about universal basic income and the objection that always, always arises is that this is going to be inflationary if we pay everybody some money. 
But the way our banking system works, which people do not understand, yeah. is that all of our money is created by banks when they make loans, or 95% of it. And so the money is created as a loan, and when it's paid back, the money supply shrinks. So this was Daryl Hermanutz's idea in a book that he just wrote. I was hoping to interview him, but I guess he's a bit shy. Uh, he's Canadian, and he's a social creditor. By That's the discipline he came up from. Um, so his argument is that if you give a universal basic income and you require people who are, I think his idea was to say people who have outstanding debt like they're in arrears as opposed to just paying your mortgage, um, that that money would automatically go to pay down those debts. So he figures that overall about 50% of a universal basic income would go to pay down debt. And what that does is to shrink the money supply, extinguish the money supply. So you would actually not be inflating, you would actually be deflating the money supply with that with that half, and then the other half would supplement, you know, so you, your money supply would be back where it was to start with, which I thought was brilliant. Um, I just wrote an article about on Trump complaining about the Fed ain't raising interest rates. Well, it's absolutely true that raising interest rates is going to collapse the economy because we're so debt-ridden, and when you raise interest rates, the money supply shrinks for two reasons. First of all, if people pay off their debts, then um, then that cancels out some money. And because that increases the costs of producers, which will necessarily drive up the cost of their products, they have to raise their pro- product prices to cover their costs. But I did want to go back to what you were saying about um, one of the things that this program has done, I think you've really made a big shift in awareness by pointing out after the Bank of England uh, and that basically said it yet again in 2014 that banks are not intermediaries and that they are creators of new money uh, when they make loans. Uh, I think that's been a very important contribution that we've uh, made in all of the programs because it totally changes the way the, the world sees money. Yeah, when I first wrote Web of Debt, it was published in 2007, and I started writing it in 2002. So at that time, this was blatant conspiracy theory. I mean, everybody, well, my ex husband <laughs> said, You're wasting your time writing that book, and that's not the way it is. You know, he said, I mean, now he's come around, and we're good friends, and he agrees it was a good idea. But did my <laughs> son, who had a, has a degree in economics, he said, No, Mom, that's not the way it is. You know, that, it was conspiracy theory, the idea that banks actually create money. Everybody thought banks just take in money and lend it out again. I mean, okay, so they extend the credit first, but basically they're just taking in money and lending it out again, not adding to the money supply, but they are. So when the Bank of England came out and said it in 2014, I mean, I quoted a whole bunch of authorities, but they were more obscure authorities. But when the Bank of England said it in 2014, that was like landmark that they were acknowledging that that's, they said, we, we just need to set the record straight here. Banks do, are not intermediaries that just take in money and lend it out again. Banks actually create money when they make loans, and in fact, 97% of the U.K. money supply is created in that way. But, I mean, I can't take credit for that myself, but it was my writing and then positive money was in there plugging away, beating the bushes, telling everyone that money was created by banks. So they finally had to come around and acknowledge it publicly. I think they had to acknowledge it also because you've got a problem. If you think banks do only lend out their deposits, then there's not enough money <laughs> to right. go around. Right. So, they, so they had to explain how the system works here. Like, not to worry. We're not actually lending out your money. We're lending out something else. Well, certainly that's one of the things that has changed since we started doing this program, this general understanding. But as you say, most people still don't understand how banking works, and we find that at all levels, the civilian level, but also uh, in administration and public administration. Even in, sometimes in banks, it seems that uh, there seems to be some confusion about uh, what banks are really doing. So we are in this new age, as Hazel Henderson said in, in that opening clip, you know, that isn't it wonderful to live at a time 
when the paradigm seems to be shifting, where when you understand that banks can make money and how it operates, that we can create sufficient supply, and that in fact, as you've said, Ellen, that you know money needs to become a utility, not a commodity issued by private interests, but really a resource that's available to all to participate in the economy, and it's and that there is a really a human right that people should be included in the community by having the means to participate financially and monetarily. I should say, well, I got my ideas about banks creating money from Stephen Zarlenga of the American Monetary Institute, but also from Ed Griffin, who is one of the Tea Party founders right. and mm-hmm. very Republican and conservative. I mean, there's this whole movement. The movement started on the right. And people mm-hmm. used to say it was interesting that the, that the Democrats didn't seem to have any interest in public banking. I mean, of course, the people on the right didn't either. They didn't think banking was the way to go. They thought you needed to go back to gold, which I loved Ed Griffin's book right up till the end. And then I thought, really? You think gold is the answer? Um, <clears throat> so that's why I had to write about it, because I thought there was a different answer. But anyway, it's an interesting thing that people have written to me and say, I can, t- I can tell by your book, Web of Debt, that you must be a Republican, which I'm not going to claim any sort of <laughs> politics right. can go either way, depending on the issue. But my point is that this is a concept that is way across the spectrum. You know, it's not a socialist concept, which people have often pointed out that how interesting that North Dakota, which is a very conservative state, how interesting that they have this, that they're in love with their public bank. You know, they're, they have no, there's nobody ever objects to that bank. Nobody says that it's a socialist institution or that they yeah. know that it's making money for the state. It's not taking money from the state. Well, I think that what we've done here on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown, it's been a good run so far, Ellen, I think. It, I can't believe it's been five years since we started this program, but we'll see if, if we'll be doing this in another five years. You know, sometimes we think it's so slow, but if you're going to change the whole system, it doesn't happen in a day. And as they say, once you've seen the other side, you, we can't go back. So we're in this for the, the long haul, and it's an exciting one. Ellen, thank you so much for this, and we will carry on. Uh, here's to All our right. next 100 shows. <laughs> thank you. Let's start our retrospective with the discussion that we had with Paul Hellyer, Canada's most senior statesman, who was elected to office almost 70 years ago, who talked to us about the grand global agenda of the powerful monetary forces of the world and what the people need to do to survive economically. The only solution is a massive infusion of government-created debt-free money. And, you know, there's the alternative, of course, nationalization and so on. But if they want to make the present system work and to reduce the leverage of the banking system so that it no longer has a monopoly on the creation of money, then they have to have a mechanism for government-created debt-free money. And what we, a small group, of uh, what we're suggesting is that as collateral for the Bank of Canada to issue money to the federal government, that we uh, use uh, non-convertible, non-redeemable shares in Canada. In other words, get away from bonds because they all they have to be tallied as debt, and just uh, have the the government of Canada print some common shares and give those to the Bank of Canada as collateral for the creation of money. That will allow them to balance their books and. Uh, our specific uh, recipe is to have them create $150 billion a year for seven years and split it 50% between the federal government and the provinces and territories in uh, proportion to their populations. And this would allow a rapid growth of the economy, and uh, it would give the provinces uh, the power they need to make quick decisions to do the things they want. And of course, because it's over seven years, they would be able to start infrastructure uh, projects and uh, be able to complete them. They would know they'd be able to complete them and so on. During this period, the uh, bank reserve requirements, we'd have to get away from the capital adequacy system that's crept in uh, these last few decades 
and go back to the cash reserve system. And the cash reserves of the private banks would have to be increased at the rate of about 5% a year over the seven years until they reach 34%. And at the end of seven years, bank leverage would be reduced from 20 to 1 to 2 to 1, which uh, was the leverage when the Bank of England was first uh, chartered a little over 300 years ago. And this, in our opinion, would allow both sectors to operate in their own domain. In other words, the governments would have enough money to do the things that have to be done with reasonable tax levels and uh, never have a deficit again. And at the same time, between now and uh, the end of the seven years, they would have surpluses that they could use to reduce uh, some of their present indebtedness. In the Canadian case, I figure that they, if they wanted to, they could reduce the federal outstanding federal debt by about a third, <clears throat> which would give the government a lot more flexibility in its tax policies and so on, and reduce the proportion of, uh, of people's earnings that were or had to be diverted to pay interest on the existing debt. So it's a it's a well thought out program to transform the system from one where the uh, the central banks of the world, in other words, the, the the rich elite, are running the world, to one where the banks would just be able to do the things they should do, which is to provide a little financing for startup companies and small companies and uh, to individuals when they're in trouble and need uh, uh, a little financial assistance and so on, but not to operate the world as a great big casino, as uh, is the case at the moment, and do nothing but siphon off uh, earnings from the people uh, to make the rich even richer. It's that The government is going right down the line with the neoliberals and with the idea of letting people who created money out of thin air, buy up our real assets. And uh, Mm -hmm. we've had enough of that. We don't want any more. And especially the kind that's going on in the province of Ontario, for example, they've started to sell off our hydro distribution system. And so what they're doing is taking revenue-producing assets and selling them to private enterprise. And what they're then investing the money in are non-revenue-producing assets, so that the people are going further into debt and losing their and some losing some of their income at the same time. And the whole system is being loaded to I think you stated it very nicely at one time uh the, we're making us uh slaves of debt or or slaves bondage in bondage to uh, to the elite and sort of a reincarnation of the feudal system. That's Canada's iconic statesman Paul Hellyer. As we continue our 100th program retrospective, we move from Paul Hellyer's expansive view of international financial cartels and turn to the money needs of municipalities and states. Our guest Saki Bhatti spoke to us about a report that he did called Dirty Deals, which outlines the ways in which big banks are able to overwhelm government officials with slick deals and limited options for financing long-term municipal and state debt, debt that often takes precedence over the obligations of the government to serve public needs. Financing these obligations has been evolving in recent years and has become a huge financial sector in itself. Bhatti spoke with Ellen about this changing municipal finance horizon. What we looked at is really how the municipal finance system has evolved over the course of the last few decades, uh, going from what was a fairly simple, straightforward corner of of banking uh, to something that's really much more complex, and its complexity has become a goldmine for the banking industry. Uh, The municipal finance system, the municipal bonds, uh, the way that they work, uh, has really evolved and become much, much more complex, and as it became more complex, it's become more predatory. Uh, What we've seen is that as cities and states have been dealing with the war on government and the war on taxes, as tax revenues have failed to keep up with the growing needs uh, and and demands of uh, public budgets, cities and states have really started relying far more heavily on borrowing. Outstanding municipal uh, bond debt, not federal government debt, but the debt of cities, states, and public agencies at the state and local level, it's grown almost tenfold from under $400 billion in uh, 1980 
to nearly $4 trillion today. And of course, long-term borrowing for long-term capital projects makes a lot of sense. That's a sound way to do finance. But one of the big problems we're seeing is that increasingly cities, states, public authorities are borrowing to meet short-term cash flow, or they're borrowing because there's not enough money coming in. And as that's happened, uh, as cities and states have become more desperate for cash because they're not able to raise taxes enough to bring in the revenue that they need, banks have really stepped in uh, in much the same way that a payday lender uh, steps in, in uh, with a family in need uh, and offering uh, loans that are quite predatory, right? They're, they're uh, marked with what we say sort of four characteristics of predatory loans. They're uh, highly risky, highly complex, uh, overly expensive, uh, and in many ways they're either designed to fail or designed in a way where the banks couldn't care less if they fail. When you look at public budget, public budgets and public budget parlance, services are actually considered discretionary spending. Debt service is considered mandatory spending. But why is that? I, I, I mean, I could see it as a, because one of them is a contractual obligation, but it seems to me that, that the public services are also contractual in some cases, at least. I mean, they're, they're even legislated. So why is that not an equally binding obligation? The problem is that when it comes to public finance, we basically let the banks write the rules. We let them write the contracts. In the contracts, they write in that their debt is senior to everything. And the reality is that if you had the average person vote on, on the terms of those contracts, they would say, hell no. Uh, and, right. But instead of actually doing that, instead of actually setting this up in a way that puts the interest of taxpayers first, uh, we let the banks write the rules. And part of the reason for that uh, I mean, there's a number of reasons why that ends up being the case, uh, but one is if you look at the ways in which most public finance officials are trained, uh, they're trained to operate within the existing rules, which again are set by Wall Street. There's a big revolving door between public finance uh, offices across the country and banks. Uh, you also have a very cozy relationship between public finance officials and the banks that they do business with in many ways, uh, in many cases. Uh, the, public fi- uh, the public finance officials actually view the banks as their advisors, even though the bank's interests are often directly at odds with the interests of the public officials. Uh, and so that cozy relationship, that interdependence, uh, and their revolving door all create this culture in which the interests of the, the broader taxpayers and of residents are thrown under the bus. And so it's a really big problem. But that's why we actually need to figure out how we change the rules of the game. Um, and the, the other point that you raised earlier about the, the fact that you know, public officials have no problem slashing the contracts uh, with public employees, but they hold the contracts with, uh, with Wall Street to be inviolable. Uh, I mean, um, a really great example of that is the city of Chicago, uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, where there are a number of us that were calling on him to uh, renegotiate uh, toxic swap deals that the city of Chicago and Chicago Public Schools had entered into with a number of banks, including Bank of America. Uh, and um, the, there was lots of evidence uh, that had been uncovered that had actually been, you know, was widely known, publicized, ran in the Chicago Tribune articles um, that Bank of America had misrepresented, clearly misrepresented the risk associated with these deals in violation of federal securities law. And so there are a number of us saying that he needs to you know, sue the banks to get out of these deals and uh, demand that they renegotiate and let the city and the school district out of these deals without paying any termination penalties. Uh, and his response to that was, well, there is this thing called a contract. And, and he made it seem like, well, like, you know, we have this contract with the banks. We can't get out of it. There are two things problematic about it. First was the fact that we were actually saying that he should sue the banks for breach of contract because actually the banks right. breached the contract when they misrepresented the risk and violated federal securities law. But secondly, he said no irony in saying, well, we have a contract with the banks, so we can't, we can't sue them, right as he was try- proposing uh, just throwing the contract of, uh, of city workers out the window. In fact, he'd already at that point taken away the contractual raise of the Chicago teachers that was in their contract as well. And so he has no problem, uh, you know, tearing up the contract of city workers or school workers, teachers, but 
when it comes to banks who have themselves violated the contracts, he feels like he has to abide by those. Uh, and, you know, the other thing that's important to note about Rahm Emanuel is that the biggest, the leading donors to his campaign was the financial industry, and he made his own millions in the financial industry, right? So there's also that aspect to it. That's Saki Bhatti talking about municipal finance deals that demonstrate the typically unchallenged impunity of bond market financiers and big banks when it comes to dealing with our money on the municipal and state government level. As we continue our 100th program retrospective, let's look at another aspect of the subject of legal culpability. As we listen briefly to noted forensic economist, professor, and author of the book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, none other than Bill Black, one of those rare government agents who actually sent hundreds of fraudulent bankers to prison almost 30 years ago. Black knows how the system has worked and why the banks can get away with repeated felonies. And we heard him earlier in the program referring to the inability of regulators to adequately police the industry. Well, Ellen asked Black about how to deal with this frontier of fraud. So what would you see as a solution to all this control, fraud, and regulatory capture? I know you've mentioned that a public option in banking would be a good idea. Of course, I'm totally all for that, but I I just wonder what your thinking is on that. What would that look like, and how would it be implemented? Well, and uh, both uh, Wells and Deutsche Bank are good examples of this because both of them had... Uh, as major functions, indeed, Wells had as its fundamental defining strategy uh, predating on its customers. Um, Deutsche Bank did as well, although, as you say, Deutsche Bank did so many uh, things. So uh, there should be a public option, and uh, there have been many countries um, that have had postal banks, um, for example, that have provided um, customers with good old plain vanilla uh, savings uh, product uh, at uh, good prices and with high convenience. Um, I always warn that uh, there's nothing magic about public ownership uh, that prevents banks from being misused by politicians if they control uh, the banks. There have been many scandals involving public banks as well as uh, private banks. But all of them, for example, um, Fannie and Freddie, um, the conventional wisdom that's been created by uh, people spinning it is this is all about the government. In fact, it's all about perverse private incentives. Fannie and Freddie were privatized. Uh, The ownership was private. The management was private. And it had pure private sector type uh, incentive systems shaped by management to facilitate fraud. So you want to fix things, you start with uh, compensation. You don't uh, pay uh, enormous amounts of money uh, based on purported performance without um, evaluating it uh, in very conservatively for quality of the loan product and you ban cross-selling because it's inherently abusive and uh, predatory, and there are academic studies uh, on this. Uh, you give folks, you know, perhaps $300,000 a year as a salary. They can send their kids to the best schools and such, but the really big bucks, if they want to get those, uh, prove over 20 years. Uh, that that performance really was stellar and was really due to your skills. And then I don't care if they give you big bucks if you really uh, produce stellar work. But otherwise, uh, executive compensation is the thing that cries out to to be fixed. And again, it needs to be fixed. It's worse in the private sector, but they're too often when they create public banks, they create uh, very similar perverse incentives through the compensation systems. Don't do that when you create those banks. And then I, I've heard you talk about breaking up the big banks too. So. Absolutely. Uh, there shouldn't ever permit a bank to be too big to fail, too big to jail. And uh, it, this is necessary both economically in terms of avoiding systemic risk It's necessary for efficiency. The smaller banks operate better 
Uh, and, but most of all, from my perspective, it's essential to restoring democracy and ending our current version of crony capitalism. That's Professor Bill Black. Among the many notable guests we've had on It's Our Money over the past 100 programs, we particularly enjoyed having our colleague Michael Hudson, considered by some to be the world's best economist, who gave a sparkling overview of why the European Union is a flawed economic aggregation and how its approach to dealing with the Greek financial crisis of recent years is an example of how global financial interests overrule and overwhelm public interests and public rights and democracy. If you listen to his description, you'll see how America's preoccupation with privatization and financialization of public assets can lead to trouble. Well, the problem is uh, the Eurozone, which is basically a dead zone uh, following uh, austerity. The Eurozone really doesn't have a central bank uh, that does what central banks are supposed to do, which is finance government deficit spending uh, into the economy. The way an economy gets money and credit, basically, is for the governments to run a deficit and uh, spend it into it. Any dollar bills or currency that you have in your pocket is a result of government spending. If the government didn't have any money to spend, there wouldn't be any. And uh, after the Civil War in America, when the, uh, the Industrial North took over and raised tariffs, the government ran such a large surplus that it uh, sucked money out of the economy, deflated the economy, and brought over a decade of deflation. Uh, the same thing happened after 1930, 1836 and 37 when Andrew Jackson closed the Second Bank of the United States. That led to uh, the crash of 1837. Uh, so Europe is uh, essentially following uh, a guaranteed crash. It says uh, the basic uh, principle written into the Constitution of the Eurozone is that uh, really only banks should create credit and create it at interest. The governments should not provide money to the economy. Government should raise their money by selling off uh, their public domain to uh, private investors. The government should not provide social services, should not provide infrastructure services, that all of these should be privatized, and that means building into their price structure interest charges, uh, exorbitant uh, salaries, and uh, economic rent for whatever the privatizers can charge. So uh, the, the double-edged sword of being a member of the zero year zone is, number one, you don't have government credit to the economy. You don't have a deficit spending that's limited to 3% of GDP. You don't even have Keynesian recovery from a depression. You have to privatize and become a high-cost society. And uh, unless you're Germany, your population has to be cut by 30%. Your wages have to be cut by about 40%. Uh, and uh, they all have to emigrate uh, to somewhere else, like Germany. Uh, or wherever they can find work. And this is just a total disaster. That's what uh, Greece found itself uh, in and what it tried to get out of when it voted for the Syriza party. Uh, and when the Syriza people came in in January, uh, they thought, well, maybe we can reason with them. Uh, but what they didn't realize is that uh, their economist, Yanis Varoufakis, uh, was not talking to other economists. He wasn't talking to reasonable people. He was talking to lawyers. And the lawyers said, here are the rules. You've got to follow them. The rules are written into the Constitution. You have to, um, you have to make an even a deeper depression. And uh, Varoufakis and Tsipras, the prime minister, said, wait a minute. We've just had an election. The people have decided they don't want more austerity. They want to regrow, and we have a plan for regrowing. And uh, they were told, the fact that you had an election means absolutely nothing. Uh, elections don't change things. We already have the rules. It doesn't matter what a democracy is. The Eurozone is not a democracy. It's a dictatorship by the banks. Uh, banks are not elected. Voters don't have a role to play in that. If you join the Eurozone, uh, forget what the voters say. Forget democracy. Uh, you're going to do what the banks say, and we're in it to make money uh, for ourselves and for our clients. We're going to lend our clients enough money to buy your banks, your islands, your ports, uh, uh, any public uh, uh, utilities you have, your gas rights, uh, and we're going to bankrupt you a little bit more. We're going to shrink you to such a low level that we can lend our clients money to buy your privatized uh, land and uh, enterprises uh, very cheaply. 
In their conversation, Michael Hudson and Ellen touched on what money actually is and how little understood or misrepresented it is, even in some of the highest levels of academia. Hudson would assert that academia is complicit in helping to keep the true nature of money under wraps as a way of protecting the notion of exclusivity of private capital control. When you and I talk about it, we know that money is credit and that you, you create uh, money by creating a credit, uh, and uh, uh, neither the right wing nor the left uh, believe this. Uh, Paul Krugman uh, says that it's impossible for banks to create credit, mm-hmm. you know, in his infamous uh, uh, debate with uh, Steve Keane that everybody should read because it's, it's so wonderfully humorous, where <laughs> Steve was trying to explain that banks do create credit, and Paul Krugman said, no, no, banks just lend out savings. He thinks commercial banks are savings banks, uh, uh, and that's what he was taught in college. And, uh, you know, that's uh, basically why uh, he got the Nobel Prize, for not understanding money. That's the mm-hmm. precondition for getting the Nobel Prize. You have to, if you, if you understand money, then you're disqualified. That's economist and author Michael Hudson. Finally, in this 100th program retrospective, I want to share with you a conversation that Ellen had with futurist and noted economic innovator Hazel Henderson as they discussed the true nature of money and how the theory of money has changed and where it's leading us to a revolutionary time where there is no need for money to be scarce. I could envision a system where banking is pretty much all computerized. In other words, Now that we know that banks just create the money they lend on their books, you're really taking out an advance against your own promise to pay. You're really turning your promise to pay into money. Yeah. So you could do that by computer without this slate of hand that banks have. Totally, totally. where Where they pretend that they're borrowing from the depositors but they're really not. If they don't have the deposits, they borrow from another bank, and then they give it back the next day. They borrow overnight and give it back every day. So it's just this huge sleight of hand. You could eliminate all that and just say, we're just creating the money that, you know, when you borrow, you're creating that money yourself, basically out of the cloud. And it's just like what banks do, but you're your own middleman. You don't need somebody in there. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is definitely revolutionary. And uh, this book, called Blockchain Revolution uh, by Don Tapscott, you know, who wrote Wikinomics, uh, is fabulous. And he is looking at all of these applications of blockchain all through so many systems, even through government. But, I mean, basically this is what Michael Lewis was saying in uh, Flash Boys that uh, is quite true. Um, He was just saying, well, look, we actually don't need all these intermediaries and traders on Wall Street. Because all they're doing is uh, shuffling around secondary assets with each other. They're not creating new money uh, for new enterprises. Um, You know, 95% of it is just trading. And, And that was reinforced by Lord Adair Turner's book. He's talking about now it's time to take away from the banks of this inordinate uh, privilege that somehow they got to create the money themselves and just bring it back into the treasury, the national treasury. Well, and the other thing is, besides eliminating the middlemen and fraud and corruption and uh, the expense of all that, is you could eliminate the possibility of bank runs and bank yes. failures, and which is what causes all these periodic banking crises. We could eliminate banking crises by a different system where we acknowledge that you're just drawing the money from the central bank, basically, which has the power to create money. In other words, you're drawing against your own account and yes. promising to pay it back. Yeah. Isn't it extraordinary, Alan, that we are now absolutely on the cusp of this paradigm shift Uh because just too many ordinary people all across the political spectrum now as as i was noticing you know all of the various signs wherever they are they say where's my bailout you know people absolutely see Uh uh, what's going on Um, and naturally this has created all of the anger about the particular kind of globalization that really Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan cooked up, which yeah. was all about GDP growth, 
which we know was not counting all those external social and environmental costs and has been sort of driving us over the cliff. And basically, it was just about privatization, deregulation, and financialization. And, and so just we now know how many people that left behind. And, and sooner or later, they were going to rise up, whether they did in Britain with Brexit or Marine Le Pen in France or what's going on in Austria now with having a recount. You know, if there's any kind of democracy and social media now and all of this, you just can't impose this kind of cost on the rest of the population. They're, they're not going to take it. That's futurist, author, and economic innovator Hazel Henderson talking with Ellen as we conclude this 100th program retrospective of It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. In looking back at some of these conversations, I see that the trend line is toward clearing away some of the myths that surround our understandings of money, opening up a view to a new type of future for money that serves everyone, not just the few, and looks at who and what is behind much of the trouble in our world that revolves around the lack, the pursuit, and the abuse of money. You can revisit any of the 100 programs we've produced by going to itsourmoney.podbean.com. We look forward to bringing you the next 100 programs. And finally for today's program, Bob Bowes concludes his seven steps commentaries. In this segment, Step 7, Taking Humanity's Evolutionary Next Step, from our new book, Seven Steps to Global Economic and Spiritual Transformation, we are going to recap the present status of the first six steps and then discuss the final step, which consists of what each of us must do individually to strengthen our resolve and evolve our consciousness. Step 1. Exposing the story of money and usury. While there is a growing public banking movement, the public banks that do exist remain under attack worldwide by the private banking cartel. As noted in Step 4, the cartel is seeking to prohibit public banking through a variety of means, including treaties such as TPP, TTIP, and their reiterative progeny, which would also codify the private banks and their corporations as sovereign over nation states. In addition, the corporate controlled media and educational system almost never discusses economics outside the box of a privately owned system of money creation. Step 2. Rejecting the false divisions of ethnicities, religions, political parties, and nationalities. Creating and exacerbating divisions between different groups of human beings remains a key strategy for the cartel because it fulfills many of their objectives at once, including war profiteering, population reduction, and struggle for survival as a distraction from the root cause of global dysfunction, private control over money creation. One of the standard tactics to create animosities is to use agents provocateurs, saboteurs, dupes, and Manchurian candidates to perform violent acts for which one side or another is blamed. Step 3. Transposing the Money Cartel's Point of View While one of the key modi operandi of the cartel is slaughter on a vast scale, it is important in attempting to take the next evolutionary step that we do not fall for the notion that revolutionary violence will get us there. As an alternative, we should look beyond the various political revolutions of the past to a revolution of human consciousness and behavior that manifests the change through its continued focus on the root cause. This is not to say, even if massive numbers of people stood in witness to the crimes of the banking cartel, that the individuals at the top of the power pyramid would suddenly gain insight into their own sociopathic and psychopathic behavior. Nevertheless, such a strategy is an important part of a larger effort. Step 4. 
making money a public utility through sustainable economics. As we show in this chapter, a progressive society and sustainable economy is only possible through local, regional, national, and eventually international networks of public banks that create and regulate money based on the value created by labor and its adjuncts, machines, computers, robots, and artificial intelligence, and doing so without turning the accounting for labor, money, into a commodity, capital, that is, by enforcing the prohibition of usury. Step 5. Restoring Democracy World War III is taking place right now. It is, quote, the endless war on terror, end quote, which is more accurately described as the endless war of corporate state-sponsored terrorism, as well as an information war against the people. No more than a half dozen companies continue to control the mass media in the U.S., and the electronic voting and counting machines as well as the polling organizations, are controlled by the cartel as well. Step 6. Restoring Law, Science, and Logic The cartel also uses its control over the corporate and governmental sectors, including intelligence and military services, to extend its reach over thought, including law, science, and logic, by dictating the limits of public discourse and education. In our previous segment, we enumerated 12 actions to counter this dystopian agenda. As these first six steps clearly show, in a world where money is created and managed as a public utility, there is a means for humanity to live in a sustainable and progressive manner. The only remaining factor is humanity's willingness to share what the earth provides. This brings us to step seven, taking humanity's evolutionary next step. This means that every individual within the collective whole must have some practice that enables them to overcome the tyranny of the instincts and the ego. It can be as simple as taking a deep breath and counting to ten when someone presses our buttons, or as detailed as the eight limbs of yoga. The entire point is to remove one center of consciousness from the frontal lobes where it identifies with ego to our higher self where body and mind are seen as tools for discovering our gift, developing it, and sharing it with others. Peace be with you. From Behind the Curtain, this is Bob Bowes. Bob Bowes' new book, Seven Steps for Social, Economic, and Spiritual Transformation, is available from your local bookstore and online. Well, that's it for this edition of It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. Our thanks to our guests, our sponsor, Public Banking Associates, and to you for listening. Be sure to check out Ellen's latest writings on the economy and the changing world of money by visiting ellenbrown.com. And for more information on public banking, visit publicbankinginstitute.org. For information on how local and state government leaders can obtain professional insight and counsel about public banks from key national experts, visit publicbankingassociates.com. I'm Walt McCree. See you next time on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown.